good. And they're all great, but I promise you, get your pencils out, get your notepads out, however you take notes. This uh, session is about best practices from state associations, and we have four of our um, outstanding executive directors um, here to talk about some of the things they're doing in their states. Um, full disclosure, we had rehearsal calls with each of our panels before we had the actual summit come together live. And uh, when we did this rehearsal call, um, I obviously the privilege of moderating, I basically could go sit down and say, introduce yourselves and say what's going on in your states, and that is the panel. Um, there are so many great things going on across the states here. So what I'd love to do is just start first by um, having our panelists introduce themselves, what state they're from, and maybe folks, if it's you know just a line or two about why this is important. Um, and then we're going to get into a quick video from Vermont, which Lauren is using. Um, and then we're literally just going to invite our panelists to talk about the things going on in their states. Um, and you will get at least a page and a half of notes out of this, I promise. This is good stuff. So, and we'll try to leave some time for a Q&A as well. So, um, introductions, Doug, you wanna start? Yep. Hi, Doug Ute, uh, director in Ohio. And, uh, you know what, this is very important to me because you know, I'm year 38 as an educator and, and a teacher coach, AD coach, high school principal and superintendent. So I've touched all those uh, levels uh, that, and uh, student experience is very important to me and the culture of your school and, and uh, all those things and so certainly life after three o'clock uh, gives your 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 students uh, an experience that that uh, is very beneficial to their life and, and when they have a really good experience and not just the players but every student in our school would have a good experience at our events thanks doug uh, michael kruger the commissioner for the colorado high school activities association I'm going to start by thanking the NFHS for using my high school yearbook photo <laughs> in the brochure. That was really awesome. So thanks whoever did that, Shane. Um, <laughs> I, it's really a privilege to be here as a uh, former athletic director, administrator, or school administrator, teacher, all the way started back at middle school. So it's really neat to follow, actually honoring to follow the middle school panel because I I believe wholeheartedly that it is a, a need for vertical alignment and to make sure we're in a weird spot in the high school space because we do have the youth space where we know there's a lot of challenges coming up and we're trying to retrain or re-educate or just simply educate our parents on what the expectations and the standards are. And then we also above us have the collegiate professional um, levels where we're fighting a lot of what's been normalized in terms of behavior. I always uh, think about sitting at Colorado Avalanche games and are watching hockey on TV and hearing the ref you suck chants. And uh, I happen to be a season ticket holder and I will always during that time during a game, I'll hear that. I just always seem to look out in the crowd and see these young faces and think, wow, we've got a big challenge in front of us. So very passionate about the platform we have through educationally based athletics and activities. Also very passionate about working to support our officials who I think it was said on the last panel that uh, really believe there are partners in education and what we're trying to do in reaching our purpose. So uh, doing a lot of things in Colorado, continuing a lot of efforts that were made uh, in Colorado prior to my being there, so thanks. Hi, I'm Lauren Thomas. I'm Assistant Executive Director at the Vermont Principals Association. It's my second year on the job, um, enough to change my hair color, I guess, um, from that picture. But um, a couple years ago, uh, we adopted an eight-year-old out of DCF custody and had a child of our own um, right as the pandemic hit, and youth sports became the center of our world overnight. And I grew up playing, um, I played college rugby and tennis, very weird combination of sports. So I've seen the both of both, the best of both worlds, the worst of both worlds. Um, I grew up in an ice rink. Um, my brother was a collegiate hockey player. And so um, I'm really sick of taking two cars to sporting events, one for me and then one for my family to attend those events. And so my goal in Vermont is to create safe spaces for our families to have opportunities to go see sporting events and have model behavior that aligns with what their families practice in their homes. I'm Ron Nichetti, I'm the Executive Director of the California Interscholastic Federation. Chrissy used my post-COVID photo. I looked a lot different three years ago. Um, but, you know, I think the importance of this really is, is 
we say what we're about in education-based athletics, and we always say all the right things, and yet, if you look at our events today, we're not always seeing the right things. So I think we have to get back to the point where the actions match what our words are. That's great. So obviously you know a little bit about our panelists. Um, as I mentioned, we're going to show a brief video that uh, Lauren's using in Vermont, and then Lauren, would love to start with you to, you want to tee us up? Yeah, about absolutely. What this is. Yeah, so we have a very strong diversity, equity, and inclusion task force in Vermont that responds to um, events of hate speech, which are some of the most pu publicized pieces from our, our media. And uh, we started a reporting forum, much like Washington has, where people are able to report instances of hate speech and other um, derogatory things that happen in sporting events. And over three years, we have roughly, I think, 2,000 reports about that uh, reported, but we have 5,000 games entered into SB Live every year. So it's about 1.1% of our games that are triggering a report, and it allows us to work with our schools. And in this video, this is from our last championship season, um, and so it's all Vermont um, coverage um, and some profound people from Vermont, like John LeClaire, who went on to play in the NFL, or NHL, excuse me, and um, these athletic directors are really trying to make a positive difference in Vermont, and we're getting a great, great um, coverage from this, and it's being shared wildly through our youth organizations. Um, the athletic director, Sam Jackson, who's going to speak, is part of Winooski. Um, it's a refugee community. There's 35 languages spoken um, in that school. It's a very small school um, and a very fragile, um, a very fragile school that's very subjected to a lot of hate speech due to some of the underlying bias in Vermont. I always wanted to be fun. You know, you play the game with good players, you can teach them the basics, and, uh, and then you let them play, you know. It's about your mental toughness. It's emotional, the games are emotional. And Schifflin bursts into tears. That's why we do these things. We create the heat of the battle in order to have composure within that. What makes you tick and what makes you feel successful? And I do not want to minimize that. And once you are focused on everything else besides the play, you lost the game. You can win a game and act like two-year-olds, and you honestly haven't won a thing. On this team, we claw with our fingernails without age. People say, well, kids aren't the same. No, kids are exactly the same. The circumstances and the environment around them change. The kids are showing more progress than the adults are. What kind of an example are we setting? Coming from a winning at all costs attitude comes at detrimental harm to kids. You know, before you go to that game tonight, think about what you're going to see. Raise your hand if you want to put your kid in a toxic environment. Fans and parents spilling onto the court. If we can't teach life skills through this game, then why are we doing it? <laughs> When we give kids social media, we're giving them this unrealistic expectation with no training. Whatever they put out there, it's out there. Just because you hit the delete button, it's never gone. Somebody said it. Open it up to the world. We're having high escalated behaviors, trauma responses. Hey, uh, you guys gotta get out the back door because you guys are promoting violence. We gotta stop the black kid. Ghetto ball. Body shaming remarks. Most of the time, it starts with students saying that's enough. So they took matters into their own hands. Some mistakes have large impacts. Police are investigating after a man died following a fight at a boys basketball game. We're talking about a sixth grade basketball game. As parents, it's a logical thing to be defensive. And when your adrenaline rises and your blood starts pumping. You don't have to demean somebody else to make your son or daughter look better. Sportsmanship is serious. They read the announcement before every game, and I don't think people listen. We've got to spend a lot more time educating. Blame no one. No excuses. Don't talk about it. Be about it. We had three games canceled this spring due to lack of officials. Referees just don't want to deal with 
bad fan behavior. We don't have them, we can't play a game. We can do better, Vermont. What can we do to change the course? We have to get to a point where coaches aren't afraid to coach. However, if the fans are the problem, then we'll simply remove the problem. Our athletes will play with, with, without fans. Fans were denied access by the schools and the Vermont Principals Association. When something falls apart, everybody owns part of the problem. This is about all of the kids that participate everywhere, all of the fans that come and go from their events. Everyone's coming together in every different friend group. I go watch these high school football games. Like two or three guys are running over to help out the guy that they just tackled. We need to see those incidents of sportsmanship on the front page of the newspaper. I'm really proud of how we stuck together. If you get to know who's on the other side, you can embrace them too. We're one community and we need to work together as one. Make space for those tough conversations. Don't be afraid to stand up to the people around you. There's no room for hate. What's your role gonna be? Just enjoy it. It's their time. It goes by like that. These are the best times of our lives. Watch what they can do and watch where they're growing from. Support them with the ups and downs, and celebrate the milestones, not the goal. Our kids are lucky to be here. They're lucky to be in these situations. If your kid is happy, healthy, and well-balanced, isn't that what we want for our kids? You being the best person you can be, when's it come? Either that's when's in the sports game or when's in life. Our adults need to be better and model the behavior or we're just not going to have sports. Scholastic-based athletics is so worth protecting. We can use it as one way to unite communities, to bring people together. So a lot of this is going into our preseason meetings with parents. Like I said, youth groups are picking it up within their communities to put it out there to their to their families because we're too small to be so disjointed. And so if we can set that and establish those behaviors from the jump, from the first time they're exposed to athletics, then we don't have to unlearn that behavior in eighth grade to come into ninth grade. If we just have that continuation, we can start our ninth grade on a really sure foot with positive expectations for all. Thank you for sharing that. I think that could have been a lead in for this entire summit, why we're here. Um, so that, thank you, appreciate that. And good luck with that, I'd love to know how you know, if that makes an impact. Yeah, it was going viral on a Friday and I wasn't feeling well. I'm like, oh my God, what am I doing? Something's wrong. And my husband's like, no, that's a good thing. That's what you want to happen. I'm like, okay, keep it up. That's, a, go. that's a good virus yeah. to not yeah. feel well. Yeah. Right, right, good virus. Um, so obviously our state associations, all 51, their leadership and their staffs um, are very committed to supporting education-based activities and, um, and embracing the challenges that come with it. So. Our four panelists are here to share with you some of their best practices. Um, and Doug, obviously, I'll start with you here, just directly to my left. Um, obviously, decades of experience as a school leader and administrator in schools, and now leading a state association. Would love to know um, some of the things you're doing, and maybe um, you know what you might offer in terms of advice for the group as you're describing some of the things you're doing in Ohio. Yeah, sure. So Bob would tell you, Bob Goldring's been in our office for nearly 30 years. We have a whole wide variety of things that we have just sitting there. And, and it's time to now look at our delivery out to our schools uh, because they're not coming and, and looking for things. And, uh, you know, I'm sitting watching the video there and, and thinking about a few things. We're seeing a, a, a huge uh, influx of our athletic administrator jobs going to young kids uh, who have a sport management degree because none of the teachers and former coaches want those jobs anymore. And so we're looking at a whole wide group of youngsters coming in that have never taught a day in school, never ate in a school cafeteria, 
aren't connected uh, to the school. Uh, and, and so it's time for us to help them uh, deal with parents and those type of things. You know, my coaching background gave me a great experience with dealing with a community and parents. And, and uh, we're, so, so what we're doing now is we're just in a development stage and, and uh, we have some things to show you that and one of the things, when I stepped out of being a teacher and became a principal and started evaluating and a superintendent getting around, because I'm not a desk sitter, so I was in out, out of a lot of rooms, so man, there's a lot of good teaching going on here. When you ask somebody to share with their peers, they start splotching up on the neck and they get nervous and they don't want to do that. And, and so we have a lot of schools in Ohio doing a lot of good things, uh, but they keep it a secret. And so what we're creating now is, is uh, buckets uh, of, uh, of ideas that you can pull in and, and, and take out. So our buckets consist of um, officials, student section, coaches, uh, fans. I am going to ask these people to steal Jennifer's comment today. Uh, first of all, you'll make me look like I know what I'm talking about because for a year I've been telling folks, what are we doing at our parent meetings? And I just heard from a parent in Ohio that's tired of seeing the same old videos and, and those type of uh, things there. And so getting out to our ADs, my wife uh, is a retired school nurse but still crazy enough to keep coaching volleyball. And she had her parent meeting a couple weeks ago, came home on a Sunday night. And I said, how'd it go? Pretty good. What'd you talk about? Oh, yeah. I said, what did AD talk about? She said, he wasn't there. <laughs> and I just, I stayed positive and just went away and complained to myself <coughs> in another room. But, but uh, so we're really going to hit an effort of, of sharing. What are we doing at our parent meetings? You have that audience sitting right in front of you. And so we should be talking about these type of things. And, and I don't know if uh, the guys back there are, are queued up. I'll just show you an example of, of uh, we want people to put, pl place things in these buckets, schools with good ideas, and we want them to be able to pull some things out. And, and uh, student sections, a couple of things that as we get going here, one of the things I heard from, from a school, what they do, they pull a student out of the student section, not a player, not a student athlete. Just a student out of the section and they read a message. It's our game, is what our students have come up with. It's our game. And, and uh, uh, have that student read a message about the expectations that the school and those students have for their athletic event to the entire uh, crowd there. And uh, I thought that was brilliant. That goes in that bucket for, for folks. But also, here, here's a, uh, a video. I don't know if you play that. It's just 52 seconds. It's not long of an AD, uh, one of their peers, talking about what he does in the student session. So to boost our student engagement in uh, the student session this year, we started, uh, we did a video session uh, of several of our chants, uh, and it was led by John McLean, and, and uh, he's a music director at Logan High School, very enthusiastic, and he and some of the student pep leaders taught all of our students these chants. We videoed it uh, through our broadcasting class at Logan High School with Matt Stone, the director, and uh, we published those, put those on uh, YouTube, so there's, there's much more engagement with our students now with uh, coming to extracurricular events and knowing what to say and how to say it during the chants and everything like that. So we're pretty excited about it. We're getting ready to do another one also to add some more chants to it. Uh, so hopefully that'll go over well. Again, not 25 minute video, short one minute vignette of, of different things that schools are doing for, for folks. And that will help me out because I'll guarantee you starting this weekend, I'll start getting reports from officials about behavior and those type of things at games. And then, and then when I call that school and have that conversation, I'm gonna be able to share with them, uh, have you checked out some ideas in a bucket for fans or those type of things? And it's almost like, you know, as a school administrator, every time I sat a student down, we have 10 characters of, of, uh, of good character in our school, what, what our students, what our staff, what our school will be about. And I could say to them, how's disrespect? That's number seven. How did your disrespect towards that staff member accomplish our goal of, of being respectful. And I think that can help that, that AD have that conversation with a parent or a player or a coach and, and that, so. Uh, yeah. So in addition to the buckets, and I believe you said you were posting them on your website, so it's like a, almost a interactive kind of 
people can dump stuff in best practice, people can draw things out. Um, and you have university partnerships as well, is that right? Yeah, we're developing this with uh, Life Sports Group at Ohio State University, which we're already a partner in, in uh, training. We've trained over 8,000 coaches in mental wellness. Ohio just passed the law this year, but we're a few years ahead of it uh, from a Susan Crone Exchange uh, grant that we received to train 15,000 coaches on the wellness, the mental wellness of our student athletes, which is going over very well. And, and so our partnership with uh, the Ohio State University and and it's because it does give us access for these videos to, to have Ryan Day put one in there or or something like that. But I think it's best coming from their peers uh, from that. Yeah, that's terrific. So we look forward to checking out your website and watching those buckets fill up so we can all steal from those buckets in our own states and federation as well. So, so do we, Chris. And I've already got Jennifer down here. She's going to do a couple <laughs> of them for us. And so I, I appreciate you volunteering yourself. On the, I actually volunteered. You'd be great at that. You've been so, told. Yeah. So that's it. That's right. Well, she'll be wonderful. So yeah. we appreciate that. And I would just add to you along that, it would be made one too in Vermont. It's called VermontThirdSpace.org. The third space being not home, not school. The place you come together for finding community. And it's an it's a RTI approach to creating safe spaces. So you have tier one and you have your targeted audiences. And so it can build upon um, and move on to that tier two, which is building administrators and giving them support. Because our building administrators also need the support of how to follow up and support their athletic administration who work long hours. And we need to protect them at all costs and keep them as long as we can because that's what's good for our communities. So Lauren, the RTI, so folks who are, in, are familiar with the school environment, response to intervention, right, that approach. So you've incorporated that now. Yeah, I didn't need to create a new wheel. There was already yeah. one that existed and sounded familiar. So I just stole it, called it something else, but then put some good activities in there. And it links a lot of our resources in there um, that we use, like our pregame statement, again, that our student athletes read together. Um, and it, beautiful moments of English language learners um, reading the statement, getting help from the opposing team with some of the challenging words. And it just sets the tone that this is education-based athletics from the start of the game. Yeah. Can you talk, what is the tier one, tier two difference? Sure. Tier one is a proactive approach that's going to hit about 95% of your audiences. If you do some of those, just like physical court barriers, setting them warm, welcoming, everything we've talked about today. And then it rises to that tier two of the administrative support, uh, getting a restraining order, temporary restraining order on um, parents or um, whatever is under the purview of the building administrator. And then the tier three supports is the superintendent's organizations. Um, and other things within their purview um, and just trying to build up an encompassing website for folks to know this is what you can do. And some of our athletic directors have shared with their coaches and are like, I had no idea I could do any of this. And so it's really helped empower our game day workers to make informed decisions that's best for kids. One of my favorites is pause the game. Why do we have to wait for the car accident to happen if we can see it happening a mile away? You're gonna have at least two months of work or you could have a 30 second pause of co-regulation within your team and just settle down. Get back to the game and continue on. Just taking that pause can be so beneficial in how you're gonna go forward with your athletics. And as we see kids with more social and emotional trauma and trauma responses, they need that pause and they need the adults to step in and intervene on their behalf to co-regulate with them. So are these resources on the site, Lauren? Yeah. So if we yeah. go on to the Vermont, yeah. yeah. Um, so you'll see how you have to find tier one through three. And, and My husband's a graphic designer, so he has set it up for me, and I just plug the information in. That's it. Uh, great. Uh, Ron, how about California? Share with us. So um, where we started was at the beginning of our last school year. We had had a lot of bylaws in place, and yet they're just at their rules. And, and so how do we get our schools to not only enforce the rules but embrace the rules what we're trying to do so at the beginning of our last school year uh, we sat down as a staff and with prominent stakeholders board members uh, looked at our mission and, and said you know we have we haven't touched our mission statement in years and, and frankly it, it wasn't a very good statement as it was so we looked at there's two main areas that, that we identified in there and one of them was all students uh, should be afforded the opportunity to belong connect and compete and we didn't just make it about, we said an education-based experiences. Because what we do isn't just about the sport or what's being played on the court or the field. It's about the people in the stands, the other kids who come watch, the parents. And at the end of the mission statement, we talked about we need parents and community supporters 
who display positive behavior in our events to allow our students to be able to have the experiences they deserve. And so then moving forward, everything we do is tied back to, is this what our mission is? Does this fit? If it doesn't, when schools don't do something right, tell us how that fits with the mission of education-based athletics in California. So, so I think that was a good starting point to us. We have our bylaws like most of you have. Um, ours weren't very good three years ago. It was just simply we kept suspending someone one game, one game, one game. They weren't getting the message. So we put in an escalation for, for student athletes, for coaches, and for spectators. So that if a student athlete, just a regular ejection uh, for uns, just general and sportsmanlike behavior, they're out of the game the first time. The second time, it's three games. The third time, their season's over. And, and for coaches, uh, the same, a game. The coaches, the second time, could be three to six games. Third time, their season's over. Spectators, the first time they're asked to leave, they don't come back the next game. What helped us out there, I think you probably saw the video in the basketball playoffs last year in California where a very prominent NBA player was asked to leave a high school sporting event that his son was playing in. And that really hit home with everyone that if they're gonna escort that person out of the gym, they're gonna do it to me as well. The spectator, a second time it happens, their season's over. Um, for fighting, we took it to a different level and said that the first time there's a fight on the field, anyone that participated in the fight or left the bench area, they're immediately out for three to six games as a player. Uh, coaches, uh, the same, and, excuse me, the coaches, the first time. If you're a coach, you engage in a physical altercation, your season's over. Um, and then it, it escalates from there the second time for the players. Uh, their season's done. And it was interesting, I was talking to Joe Hines, our coach from San Diego, because we're, we're divided in 10 different sections. And so we have commissioners in charge of each section. I was asking him what he saw. He said, interestingly, you know, we're seeing a decline in the student athlete ejections, but we're not seeing much with the adults. And it just shows the students see the new rules and they get it, they want to play, so I'm gonna pay attention, I'm gonna learn. If you put a rule in place, I'm gonna follow it. Where the adults, it's not changing. So, so what do we need to do to get the adult behavior to change? And that's where we got to the point where we need to provide our, our schools and our administrators with resources. So we looked at, you know, similar to what Doug mentioned in Ohio, we're taking the best practices from the schools out there, and we're in contests all the time. I went to a couple of volleyball matches and a football game up in very northern most part of our state, and before the game, before the volleyball match on a Thursday night and the football game on a Friday night, I watched a student athlete in uniform from each team read a statement to their parents about how they want them to behave during the game that day. And you could have heard a pin drop, where when our announcers read that, people are just talking right over it. It's like when a child goes to a school board meeting, everyone pays attention, right? It's the only time we can get our state legislators to be quiet on the floor is on Scholar Athlete Day when there's a student there. So, you know, so we utilize the students. So we're using the best practices from our schools out there to, to help us in this. So it's kind of like, you know, as I talking to Rebecca from office, it's about, it has, can't be rules, it has to be rules and tools. What, what are we providing to them to help them? We put PSAs in place. Uh, we did a three minute PSA that they could use in a parent meeting. They were all done by our student athletes. It asked our students, how do they feel when their parents act this way? And it was amazing. You, you, you watch it and you realize that's what it's supposed to be about. How can a parent watch that and not pay attention? And then we did 30 and 60 second versions of those. Um, I'm amazed how many schools now have video boards, but they do. And so we put it out there for them to utilize there, and then also uh, audio only versions to utilize. And um, you know, finally, you know, we, we need to show our schools that we mean business in doing this to the point where we're gonna give them some financial support. So we set aside a grant you know, we have over 1,600 member high schools in our state. So we set aside a grant of over $300,000, and we tell, we're telling every league, every conference in our state this year, if they do a league-wide sportsmanship meeting, and they must have the following components, they must have an administrator, athletic director, a male and a female coach, a male and female student athlete from each season of sport, and we're saying, you can do what you want at the conference, but it must include these areas. You must review our mission, you must review our sportsmanship toolkit, we, you must review the download and review the NFHS Bad Behavior Program. And then finally, we put on there, um, I, we, we took this from Oregon. Uh, Peter Weber and his staff in Oregon did an incredible job in developing a program about preventing and interrupting discriminatory behaviors. And so we, we took that, made it our own with their permission, 
uh, we were seeing events that just shouldn't happen in high school sports. Uh, we had to take away, we vacated a championship from a basketball team in the southern part of our state, uh, predominantly white team playing a predominantly Hispanic team at the end of the game. And the coach knew about this. Uh, the coach didn't participate in it, but a few of the players did, literally threw tortillas at the Hispanic team. It was one of the most disgusting things I've ever seen happen at an education-based athletic event. And you know, we vacated their title because of it. We put educational programs in place. And then finally, what we're doing this year a little differently, we're not making it mandatory, but we're putting what we're just deeming a CIF day of service. And we're asking our school communities to partner with, maybe you partner with your rival before <coughs> you play that game. And you go out the day before and you do some sort of service together in your community and uh, have an impact on what you do to really show people that what we do is different from every level of youth sports out there. And so we're hoping that'll have a big impact. We already have a school in the Bay Area that does it. They play a volleyball tournament every year. They invite only four teams. They all go do service in a part of the community. They come back and then they play a volleyball tournament together. So those are some of the things we've been doing. So a question comes up, Ron, especially in a state your size, or Doug, you've got 800 plus schools. You both, Lauren's a little smaller, but. A lot smaller. A lot smaller, <laughs> but there's, there's the challenge that is big anywhere, and that's enforcement. How do you, did you have to get buy-in from the school administrators, athletic administrators, both, or how does, how does California you know, pay attention to that? I think, well, number one, any bylaw we change, yes, absolutely. I mean, they voted, and these, it was passed unanimously, and it's not always, we don't always have everything that's passed unanimously in what we do. Um, but I think, you know, where we really noticed the difference last few years is going is we all get out there to our preseason administrative workshops that all of our schools, all of our sections do. You know, we just saw administrators that were just kind of hungry for this, help us here. You know, this isn't what we want our gyms to look like. You know, we don't want our our pool decks to look like this. And they weren't just seeing it anymore. You know, these say, yeah, okay, we know it's gonna happen in basketball. You know, you know, it might happen in football, a little harder for people to hear. But we're seeing it across the board now in every single sport. And to the point where, you know, we need some, and that's where we have to say, look, you enforce this and we are going to support you 100%. When the media asks us about it, you know, you did the right thing. And I think our media is also, starting to call people out on this. You know, everyone says, well, social media is a bad thing. Well, there's, there's some, you know, I won't always disagree with that, obviously, but I think one positive part of social media is that it started to really expose some things that were always happening out there, but we just didn't see it. We didn't know about it. I mean, we wouldn't hear about some of these discriminatory events that are happening. It's a good thing that that's being exposed because it has no place in what we do. Yeah, because that, that's on our agenda, actually, for our regional meetings, is to, to really hit our schools on a condition of membership in Ohio High School Athletic Association, is that the principal is in charge to make sure our bar laws are, are followed. And we're not in charge of their events uh, during the season. We're in charge of our events uh, in tournament, but we're not in charge of their events, and, and uh, nor is the official. And we're trying to educate our, our folks on that. The official's there to officiate. Uh, and one of the things I'm seeing uh, is that it's, it's, it's like a reverse. We just had the middle school folks talk and they did a really good job. But if you think about our, our less experienced officials are down there, and a lot of times there's no administrator at the game. Uh, I ran into situations last year where they call a faculty manager uh, because they don't want to wear their athletic director out. And that faculty manager may be an assistant football coach that doesn't even teach at the school. And he's got the cash box, shows the officials to the rooms, and when they have an issue, he's not trained, he or she isn't trained on that. And so we have to put a big effort out from our office to our administrators to get them to understand, you're in charge of this event and the safety of everybody here. And so we're really gonna uh, beat that to death this fall uh, so that that gets, that gets covered because, you know, I, I, I saw an event where in middle school last year where official young kid just turned around and said, you're out. And the guy said, you don't know who I am, I do. And the faculty manager came over, removed him out of the lobby, and then he re-entered the game there. And it just, uh, these officials need support. And uh, 
So, so if you're one of the, if we're talking about that behavior be learned as they come into high school, then we need to put a bigger focus on our middle schools to make sure that that gets taken care of. So I appreciate that. When we had our earlier breakout, I was in the breakout with JP and Emory. Bill Top was in there from NASO. Bill, where are you sitting right now? There you are. And uh, he begged a very humble minute on a small soapbox just to say, let's all remember that our officials are not professional officials unless they're at the highest level. We're, we're people. And um, I don't know, Bill, if you want to share, you asked us some, some questions in the beginning about, would you run through those three questions? The, the football questions? Yeah, how many are yeah. mistakes, those questions. Well, it's a, it's a nice test to take where you're setting expectations for officiating. It's kind of a fun game to play with, with mixed groups like this, but show of hands or ballpark. Well, how, how many mistakes do you think are made in the, in the NFL game, the average NFL game by the officiating crew? Just shut out numbers. What do you think? Five. 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 Some, somebody was in the room. <laughs> <laughs> Ten. You shut here. 30, 40, 50. You know? It's five. It's 4.8. And then, very good, Elliot. And then at the college level, major college level, you know, what do you think? Yes. Okay. Yeah. It's about it's about eight, about seven point eight mistakes per game. They're measurable by the professionals that evaluate them. So as you trickle on down, what do you think is going to happen at your high school and your middle school game? Right? We're going to have a dozen, fifteen, maybe twenty mistakes in a game, and yet we're treated the exact same way as the professional official. The expectation is that you know the old adage is got to start perfect and then get better from there. It's just so unfair. Bill, uh, with all due respect, I think it's a Broncos game, it's about 52. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. They, they throw the curve, they might get just for that. Very good. That's great. But as we want to recruit officials that look like our students, are you protecting them? Are you creating, at the end of a contentious game and you have a female official, are you walking them to the car? Like, why would a female put themselves in danger to participate in a field hockey game or a person of color? Like, we need to do better at protecting our officials before, during, and after the game. I've walked plenty of officials to their car, and they thank me profusely. And, I'm, you know, I'm just a white lady walking into their car, but it's at least somebody that's with them just to be there to support them as they get home safely to their families at the end of the day. Doug, I appreciate that. I think um, officials also remember around the concussion energy when that pendulum was pinned. You know, who's going to be the one to make that call when there's a concern about a potential head injury? It's not their job. You know, this, this is a reminder that we've got to engage our administrators and let's all understand our responsibilities collectively. So, Doug, I appreciate that. You know, and Bill, I appreciate those questions, but I think one thing we're assuming is that parents are rational and want to understand those questions. Um, we were at our golf championships, and we're very lucky at our golf championships, we had the NCJ and the SCJ organizations in our state. So they provide us with volunteers, so we have at our state championships, we have a walking rules official with every group. So the kids love it. It's like being in a professional tour event. And so we had a gentleman starting the event, and he, that gentleman would always walk with the last group. And that group happened to have one of the top players in the state, and one of the top jerks in the state was Dad. And so Dad came up in the middle of the round and cornered me and said, I want the rules official replaced. He doesn't know the rules. And I'm like, what group your son did we look? And said, actually, um, do you know who that is? He goes, yeah, he's horrible. <laughs> and I said, no, that's the guy that has started the last 15 US Opens and has walked with the last pairing on Sunday. He's the rules official that Tiger Woods, who's from our state, would request because he said he's the one person who knows the rules of golf better than he did. <laughs> and the parents said, oh, he's wrong today. <laughs> it, it just doesn't, it doesn't matter sometimes, you know, what you do, you know, and then, you know, obviously you get the coach and that person had to, had to leave. Um, but just parents, they're in this, and that's why we gotta go, well, I'm envious of all of you that have middle school athletics, because I think you have such an opportunity to reach parents at a younger age where we don't, in our state, we don't have that opportunity, and we gotta figure out a way to bridge that gap to get that. Thank you, Ron. Michael, how's Colorado doing? Uh, great, well, I stepped into some very big shoes. <laughs> so my colleague and general friend in the back there, Rhonda Blanford-Green, set the table for me. Uh, 
We started last year really with the challenge, and I know Rondo to understand this one as well, but we were faced with the official shortage as all of us are across the country. So we hit that as a strategic priority last year and had some great success with an initiative to recruit new officials, and we were really excited about that. We did some things with pay. Uh, and as we approached 23-24, we realized that uh, we were getting asked, I got to do a, a presentation at the NFHS summer meetings on recruiting and retaining officials. And I've been really excited to hear throughout this presentation when we've talked about recruiting officials that it is equally as important that we talked about retention. Because when 80% of our officials are leaving after two years there, it's like the book Upstream, we keep rescuing people from up, uh, you know, from the river, but we're not figuring out why they're falling in. And so in our strategic priorities for 23-24, we really refocused our efforts on not just recruitment, but retention. And that led us to a bigger discussion on sportsmanship. And I use the word sportsmanship specifically because where we, we learned from there was as we started to talk about initiatives and ideas behind sportsmanship, we were really starting to focus more on sporting behavior. We have bylaws, we have initiatives in place, we have processes in place to deal with sportsmanship is such this big umbrella and when we talk about sportsmanship it's so big so we were really talking about sporting behavior so uh, my teammate and colleague Rashawn Davis who oversees sportsmanship and our student activities and student leadership in our office we spent a good portion of the spring talking about what do we need to do and in moving into the new year a couple of things that hit us and what I would share with you today is we really realized that for us to address sporting behavior one of the challenges is the unified definition of what that looks like. And for our state, that, that is really, um, I know as years as an athletic director and a coach, and what I mean by that is if we all took a field trip right now and we went to any three or four gyms in any high school across the country, we could sit there and walk into that gymnasium or the field or whatever court, and we could say this is what we think this on the level, this is what good sportsmanship or good sporting behavior looks like. We could walk to another gym and we would have, but it's mostly subjective measurements. We have a lot of subjectivity in that measurement. Second thing is, is and I know Colorado, one of the things we're talking about is when you walk in one school, there's a standard that's been established for sporting behavior here, but I can go literally five miles down the road and there's a little bit different standard for sporting behavior at this school. Until we as a membership can all buy in and have somewhat, and I know it's naive to think it'll be perfect everywhere, but we should have a unified definition of what good sporting behavior looks like, and that, could, and that can start with the state. The other thing, two things that really stood out, and we talked about both of them up here, is we definitely need to find support for the game management personnel. We've been doing a lot of work with our State Athletic Directors Association. I know I'm still uh, blessed to be involved with the NIAAA, and uh, in some of the courses that I get to teach, we've incorporated uh, some training for new athletic directors on what game management means. What does that look like? What are your responsibilities? What tools do you need to walk in and make sure this event is set up for an environment that will support and promote good sporting behavior? We have such a high turnover in the realm of athletic and activities directors that we're training new all the time. They just simply don't know what they don't know. And we're starting to find the more we talk to even our veteran ADs, like was mentioned earlier, they hopefully are not having to attend every event, but have they spent the time to instruct and inform and educate the administrative team or the other folks that are there? Because once we have a unified definition of sporting behavior, then what we need is an accountable adult at every contest to help us maintain and uphold that standard. And we've got to educate. The next thing that we were talking about in that realm was that really for systemic change to happen, we have to start at the top. And one of the challenges that we were thinking is we sometimes get this narrow thinking about sporting behavior that it's just about Friday night, and it's just about in the gymnasium. And it's just about making sure that behavior is good in that gymnasium. When really what we're talking about, and it's already been shared in the middle school panel and this panel and others throughout the morning was, we need to create an environment in our schools that is inclusive, it's supportive, but that's the way we do things at our school. It's not just about Friday night at the, at the sporting event, but I'm talking about all the things we do in our school community. We have made a vested interest and a vested effort in, in Colorado to get in front of our Colorado Association of School Boards members, our Colorado Association of School Executives, um, our principals associations, and partner and say, we, it's about creating a community within our schools 
that support this and promote this. So those are some of the efforts we're making along with, as we met with our, all, all of our schools to kick off the new year about a week and a half ago, uh, challenged our, our state to, we're developing a task force to look at some of these things and, and to identify what some of the tools are. And the last thing I shared with you that we're starting to look at is to really study uh, the psychology of group behavior. And what I mean by that is where to, to reinforce the importance that we can't just continue to hope that our crowds, our student body, our parents, that we hope they get it. Because we say that sporting behavior is really important and here's our standard. If we don't invest in the educational effort, I'm talking about curriculum materials that we develop for our, for our stakeholders, our ADs asking for those things. Uh, working very closely with our activities directors in our states, whether the AD wears both of those hats or not, but really working closely with activities directors to educate our student body, because we think, we can't just assume they're gonna get it because that's our expectation. And when I see the psychology of group behavior, what we do is we're using that as a training tool to say, if you study research that's been done around group behavior, and one of the best ones you can find is the, it's a really easy to find on YouTube, but it's, it's a person sitting in a waiting room in a dental office, and there's about six other people sitting in the waiting room, and they're all waiting for their appointment, but they're all actors except for this new person that walked in. And as they're all sitting there, a buzzer will go off, and everybody stands up. And the new person has no idea why everybody's standing up, but after about the third time the buzzer goes off, she stands up. She stands up. And then she will sit, and then from there on, everybody gets called out of the waiting room to go to their appointment. She's by herself in the waiting room. The buzzer will go off, she will stand up. New person comes in the office not aware. Pretty soon after she explains, I don't know why we were doing this, but everybody else was doing it, we stand up. That's the psychology of group behavior. And the kids in our crowds, our fans, they are going to revert back to what we allow, because if we allow it, we condone it, and they are going to revert to that level. And so we're thinking about those things as we put curriculum materials together to help support our schools in that realm. Michael, that's really interesting. So staff professional development as well as just resources on your website, anybody can access coaches, ADs, principals. 100%, yeah. yeah. And we are doing, a, like I said, I really want to uh, point out between the NFHS, the NIAAA, the, the efforts to educate our athletic directors and our coaches uh, on this, but especially around game management has been a big issue in our state uh, and a lot of requests for that. So we're really excited about that, but not just hitting the ADs, but really trying to address principals and superintendents as well. Yeah, so important. And we know, obviously, and Rich can verify transiency in the AD community. Uh, I think at the when we had 2,700 at the NADC, 900 were first-time attendees of the 2,700. That's so roughly a third of our ADs are, you know, I call it, it's not just turnover, it's churnover. Um, we're seeing that with school administrators as well. And uh, not coming through those traditional ranks, we were good people managers as PE teachers, coaches, and now we're natural administrative leaders. But coming in from other places, young ages, um, Doug, obviously you were a superintendent. Um, how do you work with administrators with your background in Ohio? Well, first of all, you know, there was an expectation that I had for our staff, administrative staff, that we're at ball games, and we're just not there. We're engaged at the games, so a proactive approach. And, and I would tell you, I, I got, I'm not very good at curriculum uh, issues. That wasn't my job. But I got, I would say I've got an unofficial PhD at, at ball game management and knowing where, where your hot buttons were in crowds and and uh, if, if I, you know, I would have a uh, reserve seat at a basketball game, and they'll put 3,000 people in there, and, and it'll be packed. And uh, by the time I'm not sitting there, I'll sit here, sit there. I go around uh, and, and make contact. I expect our administrators to do the same thing. We wanted, we wanted an ample amount of administrators in front of our, our student sections and those things. But I could see things start to happen, and I knew the hot buttons in our crowd, and I could just go up and plop down and I, I used to give a guy a sucker and he liked orange suckers and I got him orange suckers and I give him a sucker and that was my cue to say put that in your mouth and move up a row or two and his wife would always go thanks Doug I appreciate that and uh, hey you're going to get tossed and you got two girls out there and, and he would get he would kind of get caught up in that but I could proactively see things like that and so I think that's important for our, you know, I mentioned about our ADs and, and the movement of, 
of people who didn't teach in the school. 70% of coaches in Ohio are late coaches. I'll say that again. 70% of coaches in Ohio are late coaches. It doesn't, make them, doesn't mean they can't have an impact, a positive impact on a child, a student athlete. They can, but they don't know the culture of the school. We're so excited they're coaching, we throw them the keys and you know those things, and oh gosh, I found somebody to coach seventh grade basketball, and, and away I go. And, and so, but what kind of PD are we giving those folks that we give our seven to three o'clock uh, folks in? So as an administrator, there's a lot of work in, in those things, but you know, keep this in mind. Nobody in our community comes in and sees us teach third period math or science and that. They come to the ball games. It's a reflection on how your school, the culture of your school, is what our community sees on Friday night. I believe that wholeheartedly. And, and how we interact with our students, how they behave, how we handle our community is a reflection on our school. And I think that's important for our administrators to, to know. I think that another important piece to that when we're talking about administrators, administrators by nature are somewhat competitive. Um, and uh, when I say that, I think it's equally as important to think about ways we can recognize when it's being done well. And when I mentioned the subjective versus objective measures, it, that does make it tough because most of our measurements of sporting behavior are subjective. We just kind of feel it, we still look at it. But there are things that we've shared throughout the last day which say if you're doing these things, that meets a standard of excellence when it comes to sporting behavior and creating, again, that environment where that could be promoted. So not, uh, you know, finding ways to recognize objectively and subjectively where schools are doing it well and where we can highlight those, like the best practice buckets, those are great things that we can pull from. I think in the same light, we've been working with PCA Colorado, so um, it was great to, to hear from PCA on ways not to just uh, be punitive with schools that are falling short. I know we have ejected coaches, we have issues, we've just passed some new bylaws about physical assault on officials, which we haven't had before, which we are really um, not excited to have, but we're glad to have in case that should be an issue. So some measures are punitive, but we more importantly, when we were working with PCA and Colorado to look at ways to we support, again, the ADs that are new, they just don't know right now, they're learning. What can we do to support these schools that are falling short of our unified, def our unified standard definition and st uh, standard across the state? That's a good point. Laura? Can you share me off? Okay. Um, the other piece of that, too, is are we talking and bringing in our student athletes? Because what, if what we're doing, if the intent of our policies is in having the impact on the kids that are being affected the most, and how are we bringing them into the conversation? And so in the void of administrators closing that feedback loop with the student athlete that's bringing forth the concern, you're now disjointing them and they're not going to report things back to you anymore and you're going to have student populations that don't trust you to do your job because you're leaving a void for their concern and so we really need to bring our student athletes or student leadership groups i know there's a huge group a couple weeks ago here in indy that we're learning about leadership and we need to bring them into the fold because we need their voices at the table because they're the ones that are really getting it ron any thoughts you know i think with what we've been talking about, um, you know, we, we always have every year, it seems like there's something that we have to deal with this year, right? It's, it's fan behavior, it's discriminatory behaviors we've had. And, and so that's what happens that year. I think we lose sight of the root cause of why are these things happening? You know, and what can help us prevent it? We talked about your athletic administrators, your principals. You know, I mean, our athletic administrators, a good athletic administrator can solve most of those problems for you because when they go to games, they're going to talk to that parent. They're going to go up in the stands, like, like Doug had mentioned, and they're going to address it. But we put so little emphasis on that side of the equation sometimes that we don't have always the right people in place to help us solve these problems. And then it doesn't matter what policy we put in place. So I think that's, that's the most important thing. And I think it's just a sharing of ideas. That's the best part about working with, with the NFHS staff and the other executive directors. I'm sure it's the same with our assistant directors in the office. You know, we can pick up the phone and reach out and call Robin Hines or Tom Keating or Lance or, or Charles in Texas and just say, hey, how do you guys do this? We take and, we give and take so much from each other, and, and we have to continue to do that because, you know, we all, we all need help in getting better at this. One of the things that we're noticing nationwide is an increased effort to collaborate. So like Positive Coaches Alliance, you know, we're looking at NGVs, we're looking at the AAU, we're looking at professional sport programs that 
we're working with, and without question, behavior is an issue, the official shortage is an issue, and retention of educated coaches, as well as officials, is an issue. In schools, teachers, coaches, you name it, we're short. Now it's bus drivers, apparently, as well. So um, you may not even have a bus to drive to the game where there are no officials. Um, so we're really looking at making this whole environment better. And uh, everything you're doing in your states is just tremendous. And um, we look forward to exploring your websites and just hearing more from you in person when we can. We have just you know, a handful of minutes remaining. I don't know if there are any questions for any of our panelists or if any of you have something that you'd like to share unique to your state or organization uh, regarding efforts to get at behavior. Go ahead. Um, I made a notation. There's one thing that was uh, said, I believe it was Mike, the, the standard from one place to another. I mean, that flies in the face of an athletic director a lot. Well, they don't do that at my school or that kind of stuff. So I, I think that really does resonate. The, you know, the positive coaching alliance, you know, they define culture the way we do things here. Um, and I've always used that in my presentations and equate it to being a parent. Your son or daughter might say, well, over at the Morrison's house, you can do this. Well, you're in my house. You're in the Cosworth household. This is how we're going to do it. So kind of have that conversation with our parents when that gets thrown in our face. But I think that next level of consistency is how do you get that standard? So as you know, brothers and sisters, as athletic directors, administrators, we're all really on the same page. And technically, I think we all are trying to strive for the same thing. But it does come down to that leadership component, top down, bottom up to me to really make that happen. I just, I just wanted to point that out. I just thought that was a really strong point for some of what we're trying to need to attack. Tag, that's, that is a, actually a great point to come back to to close the panel session. Um, I've mentioned out of this will come a task force to make sure that our good thinking and good sharing at this experience is not lost and not floating in space. So we will put together a group of people, I think, a challenge to come up with some standards for sporting behavior, and I would say activity behavior everywhere through the school, um, because we have some issues at our performing arts events as well. Um, so I think to look at trying to draft some standards around what great behavior can look like to give us some quantitative measurement tools would be a charge for our task force, thinking out loud here. But great place to start is, well, we met here in Indy. What are we talking about? We know what bad looks like, no question. We don't need to measure bad, but how do we measure and reward good? And what, is, what does success look like? So I appreciate bringing us back. How many years have you been, were you in AD? Um, between collegiate and um, high school, about 26. 20, yeah, it was about 30 or something yeah, to say, yeah. <laughs> So, uh, panelists, thank you. Lauren, Ron, Michael, Doug, awesome leadership with their respective <laughs>